I want to share a word with you today that, that was birthed in me the last week, in fact. I, I had a word that I was ready to present, and as happens to me frequently, I, I get into something else, and I'm stirring around in it or wrestling with it or working on it. In this case, I was doing a podcast uh, from the Old Testament. And on my daily podcast, as many of you may know, I have been working on for, for a couple of months taking Old Testament stories and, and trying to see them through a new covenant understanding. So taking the Noahs and the Daniels and the Shadrach, Meshach and the Abednego's and the David and Goliaths, all those Old Testament kind of stuff I call Sunday school stories. The stuff we learned when we were kids about the Bible, which is great. I don't know that we always learned them through a new covenant lens. And that's what I've been working on is to say, what? What would I do with that story if I believed Jesus paid for everything and finished the work and resurrected me into a new reality? How might I read Noah's Ark differently? Right. Instead of, hey, God, because, I mean, I, I don't know how everybody else was taught to interpret some of those things, but instead of making it about God's wrath or about God's judgment, what if we filtered it through the judgment of the cross? and saw what Jesus did for us, and then he becomes our boat and our one door on that boat. And he becomes the pitch, the anointing that holds that boat together. And he becomes the safe haven for all of us so we can float above the chaos of our life. And then Jesus becomes the central figure way back in a story that never mentions Jesus. Well, to me, that's rightly dividing the word of truth because Jesus is truth. So if you, you put Jesus into the middle of those stories, so that's been an adventure, and I've been enjoying that journey because what it's allowed me to do is, is not reframe the stories, but reinterpret them through my understanding of Jesus. And occasionally, as I'm doing these on the podcast, I, I stumble across things I never thought about or make connections I never saw before. And so that happened this last week. Now, the, the one that we're going to deal with today hasn't aired on the podcast yet. It'll air next week. Um, and it's seven minutes, eight minutes. And I thought, there's so much more to say than I can say in this podcast. And so I want to work on it with you today because I think that it is a very good representative of some of the very things we're going through. So I don't know how many of you have your Bibles. Yeah, whether you do or not, I'll read and, and um, I'll try to, try to read slowly and carefully. And I got a couple of comparative things right out of the gate. So we're gonna move one chapter right into another chapter, okay? Um, so I'll try to pause if you're doing the digital thing and you need some time to flip around. So start in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And before I really do any layout on this message, I want to read two verses. One from chapter 9 and a couple, or at least one from chapter 10. Look at 2 Samuel 9, 1. Now David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 2. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanun, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent by the hand of his servants to comfort him concerning his father. And that's the part, that, that kindness part's the part I really want to focus in on. I want you to note the contrast between 2 Samuel 9.1 and 2 Samuel 10.2. And they're back-to-back -back chapters, which means the author is showing us a glimpse into the life of King David. David gets in this mode of expressing kindness and primarily to people who have been his enemy. The house of Saul had been his enemy. Nahash the Ammonite had been an enemy of the, of the Israelites. Saul from chapter nine, Nahash from chapter 10. So listen to it again. I wanna show kindness for Jonathan's sake. That's chapter nine. I wanna show kindness on behalf of my friend Jonathan. And then in chapter 10, I wanna show his father kindness I want to show him kindness because his father showed kindness to me. One of the kindnesses is for Jonathan's sake. The other kindness is because he was kind to me first. Think about how different those are. 
I want to be kind to the house of Saul because I love Jonathan and Jonathan loved me. This is covenantal kindness. In fact, that kindness there speaks directly to the kind of kindness that branches forth from a covenant. And then the next one, I want to show kindness because the father was kind to me. I call this reciprocal kindness. I'm nice to you. I'm nice to your son because you were nice to me. They are two diff, they're both kindness, but they're two different sources of kindness. And I find it fascinating that the, the narrative put them back to back. I think the Holy Spirit's trying to show us something. He puts back to back two stories of kingly kindness, that the king of Israel is, is being kind to people. And in one instance, it's directly a result of a covenant. And in the other instance, it's directly a result of someone having been kind to him. So I think the Holy Spirit's trying to show us what I would call a contrast in kindness. A kindness birthed from a foundation of covenant and a kindness birthed from you were good to me, I'm going to be good to you. Or as I think of it, a kindness birthed from the kingdom perspective of we have a king, we have a covenant, and we are inheritors of that covenant. And so our lifestyles are reflections of our king versus I'm good to people who are good to me because that's the way society works. And if you're good to me, I'll be good to you. But if you're bad to me, well, the best I can promise you is that I'm not going to necessarily be bad to you, but I'm probably not going to be as good to you. And, and those are two entirely different ways to carry yourself through the world. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the Holy Spirit puts them back to back in the book of 2 Samuel. Here's David who has the authority. He's the man who can do the most good on the earth as king. He can also do the most wrong, <laughs> for sure. He has the power to express himself. So what does he do? He, he's stricken with this need to be kind, and we're going to walk through the Mephibosheth story in a little bit, try to round it out. And then I think that kindness sort of takes over, and he decides, yeah, I'm going to be kind to someone else too. And he moves into, I think we get an example of what happens when you move into a kindness that is based upon what's been done to you. So before I break those two down, because I think we probably know more about Mephibosheth than we do about Hanun. Um, we probably know the ninth chapter a little better than we know the 10th chapter, and that's okay. Um, I never personally heard a Sunday school story on 2 Samuel 10, David being kind to Hanun, son of Nahash. Um, I would venture that most Christians um, don't have a lot of knowledge about that 10th chapter either. So, so we'll kind of walk through it together in a little bit. Mephibosheth, I think maybe a little bit, I'll refresh your memory. But I want to do something first. Um, and that is, I don't think it's valuable for me to talk about kindness expressed through covenant if you're not convinced. And I think this room is convinced, but again, we go way past this room to talk to people who may not be convinced that God is kind. Uh, that God has kindness in his heart towards, not just towards people who are good to him, who love him, who live for him, who believe in him, but that the kindness of God extends not as an occasional expression of God. That, I'll tell you what, God can be kind. No, I want you to scratch that. It's not God can be kind. It's God is kind. Anything else is the, is the shadow side of that kindness. I don't mean dark. I don't mean evil. But anything, it's, it's kind of like I, I always express the wrath of God as the shadow of God's love. Um, you want your father to be able to have wrath. Because your father's wrath is safe wrath if you have a loving father. He doesn't break your leg. He trains you, but he doesn't beat you. He doesn't, he doesn't make life worse for you because of his wrath. And so that's, that's our heavenly father. 
Our Heavenly Father doesn't give us cancer to teach us lessons. He doesn't take our job from us because we haven't been given him enough money. He d his wrath is a shadow of his love. So you, you want to experience the wrath of God. And I, and I think we got to get rid of the phrase anger when we think about the wrath of God because people are like, God's mad. But wrath is a disciplinary measure from someone who loves you. So I always use my kids versus your kids as an example. Okay? I'm like, I love your kids, but I don't love your kids the way I love my kids because they're mine. They, they come from me. And so I have a whole different kind of, I would have a whole different kind of wrath for Lethan than I would for Lauren because Lethan is a friend. Lauren is a daughter. Now I want you to think about that in heavenly terms. All right. We come into an identity that we are sons and daughters of God. We can rest beneath whatever wrath or discipline looks like from our father because it's not fuming anger. I'm going to break her leg. It's Dad loves me so much that he protects me in a way he doesn't protect that kid. He thinks of me in a way he doesn't think of it. And, and I don't want you to stretch that to the point of us versus them. You know, God loves me, but I don't love my neighbor because I'm one of his kids and that guy's a heathen. I know because I've watched. No, that, that we're going to hopefully break down in this lesson and go, that's what's hurting us is because we, but I want from a personal perspective us to look at God and go, I understand discipline being that my father's training me for my tomorrows because my father loves me. It's never my father's against me. It's never my dad's, my dad hates me. It's never my dad's putting a roadblock in front of me. It's never my dad's trying to teach me a lesson because I did something wrong. It's my father putting his hand out in front of me going, watch what we can do together, right? So when I talk about God's wrath or God's, that's what I'm talking about. It's really wrongs made right. God works on the injustices of the world by bringing justice into that situation. Now, that's from a personal perspective. That's how I see God, and then I receive that discipline as one of his sons. And this is why I'm adamant about you need sonship and daughterhood. You need to know you're part of the family, because as you know you're part of the family, then that changes how you experience God. A lot of people have a negative experience with God, not because God's doing something negative, but because they don't view themselves as part of the family. And because they don't view themselves as part of the family, they feel like an outsider. And so they've separated themselves from who God is. So let me establish from the Bible that God is kind. Not that God's occasionally kind. Not that God can be kind. Not that God meets your kindness with kindness. In fact, he's the opposite. He meets your negative with kindness. Because that's God's heart. That's truly who God is. So go with me. Just do a little journey. Go to Psalms. I want to take you to the shortest chapter in the Bible. I'm going to give you, a, I'm going to admit something to you. I know this is the shortest chapter in the Bible because when I was a kid, we would do chapter readings every week uh, in Sunday school. And you got little stars if you read a lot of chapters. And your stars changed colors the more chapters you read. And I wanted the gold star because the gold star was you led the class in chapters. So I would read the 117th Psalm like 75 times that week because it's two verses long. And I would read, and most of them I would read during the pre-Sunday school song. Like you get to church on Sunday morning and we would do like two songs and then a prayer and then they dismiss us for Sunday school. And I jammed it on the, uh, in my pew on Psalms 117 like over and over and I would sit there and count. So you'd see this little kid reading and I'd be going, and so then I could go in because I was taught not to lie. So I would go in and go, and I wasn't lying. So they go, how many, how many chapters did you read this week? Well, I'd go, 68. <laughs> and I meant every bit. I read every one of them. I read every one of those 68 chapters. No one ever caught on that you were supposed to read different chapters every week. No one told me that. If they, if they had said, listen, you've got to read a different chapter every week, then I, would have, I wouldn't have lied. I just couldn't. Do, but you, you set the rules. So I'm in. Two verses. That has nothing to do with this message, by the way. <laughs> Just a freebie. It's also for those of you who are in a situation where you need to pile up some chapters pretty quick. <laughs> Psalms 117. I don't know what that situation would be. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. Look at verse 2. His merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Now, I want you to notice that his kindness is not confined to Israel. 
This is Israel's songbook, by the way. And it doesn't say, hey, people of God, praise God, he's kind. Hey, sons of Abraham, all of those things, we would, we would accept that. Hey, sons of Abraham, praise God. Hey, those of you who are circumcised. Hey, those of you who have sacrificed unto the Lord. All of those things sound so biblical. But praise him, Gentiles, all you people, because his merciful kindness is great toward us. The truth of the Lord endures forever. What's the truth of the Lord? Well, according to that chapter, the truth of the Lord is he's a merciful God and he's kind to everybody. So the heart of God from the Jewish songbook, shortest song they had, praise the Lord, doesn't matter who you are. He's kind. Pretty good news to me. Isaiah 54. Let me show you one from the prophets. That's a song. I just want to show you that this is not not an isolated incident. It's not a new covenant thing, by the way. God being kind, that's not a new covenant invention. Like we get to the new covenant, suddenly God's nice. <laughs> that's not, if, if that's the way we're framing it, I think we're misunderstanding the heart of God. God doesn't change, by the way, God doesn't change when we get to the new covenant and God goes, okay, the old way didn't work, so we're going to try something else. I'm going to be merciful and gracious to people. We'll see if that works. Now, the heart of God has always been the kindness of God. Listen to Isaiah's prophecy from 54. Remember, 53 is the Calvary chapter. Jesus on the cross, a chapter that to this day our Jewish friends don't read, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. They don't explore that because that's, that's the Jesus chapter. But look at 54, verse 9. This is like, no, I'm sorry, not verse 9. Um, verse 8. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. Remember what I said to you about wrath a moment ago. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. Notice that God describes one as a small quantity and one as an endless quantity. A little wrath, I hid my face. I think we can see that even in the history of the Jewish people. If we were to take this prophecy post-Calvary, we might say that this is that period between the cross and the fall of the temple. We might say that the, that the um, fulfillment of this comes when God pours his wrath out on the system of works and Moses at Jerusalem. But whether we interpret it that way or not, what we know the text says is God's wrath is a little bit, God's kindness is everlasting. Notice the contrast. God's wrath's tiny. This is what Isaiah's trying to say. And this is the stuff we need to start emphasizing. To people. God's wrath was just a little bit. God's kindness is not just a little bit. God's kindness is everlasting, overflowing. His true heart is kindness. It's, it's what moves who God is. Verse 9, this is like the waters of Noah to me because I've sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you nor rebuke you. For the mountain shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you. Nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. And here Isaiah does something special, something very new covenant. He connects the everlasting kindness of God to a covenant of peace. And so he attaches God's kindness to the fact that God's heart is to live in a covenant with us, a covenant of peace. A covenant of peace means I'm not at war with you. If you and I are in a covenant, I'm not going to fight you. I'm not battling you. It's not me versus you. It's not you and I fight it out until you get to heaven. No, it's I want to show you I'm kind on the foundation of a covenant. Now, remember what I said earlier. There's a kindness that comes through covenant, and there's a kindness that comes reciprocal payback. There's a kindness where you say, I want to be kind to the house of Saul for Jonathan's sake. And there's a kindness that goes, hey, I want to be kind to this guy because his dad was kind to me. One of them is, this kid didn't earn it, but I'm going to be good to him anyway because I have a deal with I have a covenant. The other one is, I'm going to be good because they were good. Two different kinds of kindness. So Isaiah says, God doesn't want you confused. The wrath is a little bit. The kindness is forever. And the kindness from now on is going to be built on your covenantal understanding of peace. This is why I say to people, you really need to, you really need to hone in on the new covenant. You really need to pay attention to what the new covenant gives you. Because 
God's in a covenant, meaning God has shed blood to keep his end of the covenant with you. And that's a covenant of peace and a covenant of kindness. That means something to us. Let me give you one more. And this one's from the minor prophets. This is as we, dra we, we, we kind of start wading into those little bitty books. This is probably one of the most famous. Go to Jonah. If you go to Micah, you went too far. Like that helps, right? Because Micah's so easy to find. If you see Micah and Habakkuk, you've went too far. Backtrack to Jonah. Um, this is a freebie right here. I want to share with you what I think might be the saddest transition in the entire Bible. Okay? This is from my own study. Look at the end of three. This is God talking about Nineveh, that idol-worshiping, child-sacrificing, violent nation that he sent Jonah to. So go, you go preach to them. This is, the, to me, the saddest, trend, the saddest transition in the word. Verse 10, God saw their works. They turned from their evil way. God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. That, to me, is the saddest chapter transition in the Bible. Why? Chapter 3 ends gloriously. God says, I, I'm not going to do what I was going to do. I, I'm, I'm going to spare them. I'm going to be merciful and kind. I'm going to forgive Nineveh. And what does God's man of faith and power do with that? He gets mad and becomes angry because God didn't give those people what they deserved. <laughs> it's a sad moment in the ministry of Jonah because what Jonah wants to see is God fry Nineveh. And when God, and, and man, I, when I always share this, I always just say this. Let's always check our spirit and and. Just take a little self-inventory. Self-inventory is not bad in the message of grace, by the way. What's bad about self-inventory is if you're doing it to achieve righteousness, you're doing it to achieve favor. If you're doing self-inventory to make sure you're in the faith, you're in the new covenant. Because Paul said, examine yourself to see if you'd be in the faith. And in the faith is a covenantal understanding. I know who I'm in covenant. And we do need to do a little self-inventory once in a while, make sure that when we get it, when we start talking about what everybody's about to get, that we're not saying it because we're hoping they get it. We gotta be careful about that. So well, I'll tell you what's gonna happen. This is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen. Check your spirit, make sure that that list of things you said you think is gonna happen is not, the, is not the things that you hope they get. And I mean genuinely in your spirit because that's the Jonah moment that every Christian has to confront is God comes to you and God says, I'm not gonna do this, I'm not gonna do this, I'm not gonna do this. And in our spirit, we go, but they deserve it. But that's, you don't know what they did to me. And they deserve it. And that's, that's the great challenge of resting in the, in, in the covenant. Because I think a lot of times we perceive the kindness of God and we receive it and we love it. But there's a little piece of us that kind of wants God to show out a little bit on the people that's being mean to us. Show out a little bit. Show that, show that, show that anger side a little bit, God, and, and defend me. And, and I'm not telling God what he can and can't do, but I can only control how I perceive what God does. And I want my heart to be that, that I want to see God's kindness and mercy on them to the same level that it's on me. And I think that's an important part of this. Um, that's not even the verse, though. That's just a transition. That was a freebie. Look at verse 2. Here's what Jonah says to the Lord. Now, this is weird. This is a great contrast, by the way, in Bible study. Darkest transition in the Bible, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10 to Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. Greatest gospel presentation in the Bible, the very next verse to me. Jonah 4, 2. Listen to what Jonah says to the Lord. Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish because I know you're a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. What a five-fold presentation of the gospel. That's the perfect new covenant message. Look at those points again. You're gracious. You're merciful. You're slow to anger. You're abundant in your loving kindness. And you relent from harming people. You, can, you can't get more new covenant. You can't get better at presenting the God of kindness and love than Jonah's fourth chapter, verse two. And he's not even preaching to people, he's preaching to God. 
<laughs> it's weird. You would think he would have turned that on the Ninevites and went, hey, let me show you the five points of who my God is. Instead, he turns it on God and goes, you know the whole reason that I didn't even want to go down there is because I know you're this, 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 and this, and you proved me right. You are all of these things, and I don't like that. I, didn't, I don't want you to be these five things today. Today, I want you to be something else. I want you to be the God that skins Ninevites alive because they deserve it because you don't know what they've done to my people. You do know what they've done to my people, and I want you to pay them back. And so to me, Jonah is, a, is an incredible case of wrestling with a good God who's so good, he's too good. Think about that. He's so good that you perceive he's too good. And I would dare say this, if your version of God doesn't border on too good, you haven't had a revelation of Jesus yet. You've had, you know God. You've met Jesus. You haven't had a revelation of he who is as a lamb who was slain in Revelation 1. Because we keep trying to... Nah, I don't, that's too broad a brush. We tend to tamp down the goodness of God for fear that people will take advantage of it or for fear that people will sin in the face of God, or that they won't take God serious because we've corralled people with spiritual fear for so long to unleash them into the glorious liberty of just enjoying themselves in the presence of God has seemed like to some too, too good to be true. But his, he is kind, he is gracious. He relents from doing harm. To me, this, this is the reason why Jesus shows you what he shows you. You know that whole, hey, you want us to call down fire on them? They don't accept you. Let's call down fire on them, Jesus. And Jesus goes, you don't know what spirit you're of. I didn't come to destroy men's life, I come to save them. My dad was never into destroying men's lives. My father's kind, he's gracious, he's merciful. Now look how the New Testament handles this. I gave you a, a song, a prophet, a prophecy, and the story of a prophet. So go to Ephesians. And take a look at kindness through that lens. And then we're going to go back and, and do a brief work over with these two, no, two Old Testament stories. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 4. But God, Ephesians 2, 4. God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. I love I love this parenthetical. It's as if Paul believes he needs to throw this in in parentheses. By grace you have been saved. Look at that. He made us alive together with Christ. Grace did it. You didn't do it. You can't do it. Grace did it. That's the, that's the glorious message of grace. We talk about the message of grace. What we're saying is it's by grace that you are who you are. All right. So Paul throws that parenthetical. And raised us up together and made us set together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's not a future tense. That's done deal. I already set together with him in heavenly places. I'm not hoping to set together with him in heavenly places. In the eyes of God, I'm already with him in heavenly places. Now look at verse 7. That in the ages to come, that sounds like 2020 Springfield, Illinois. Because Paul didn't have you in mind. He did, he's, not, he's not writing to you. But he is now because he goes, in the ages to come. In whatever's out there in front of me, look what God's going to do in the ages to come. He's going to show the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So God's new covenant heart is in the ages to come. I'm going to be kind to people, but notice why. Not because people are kind to me, not because these guys are good, not because they're worth it, not because they earn it. In Christ Jesus. What's he saying? I'm going to show them a covenantal kindness. The kind of kindness that isn't built on their performance, that isn't built on their worthiness, that isn't built on their earning it, that isn't built on their works. The kind of kindness that's built on Jesus. Because when I look at my son, when I look at my daughter, I beam with parental pride. And I want to be good to her because she's mine. And I'm going to be good. This is what Paul's saying is going to happen in the ages to come, which we're in, I believe. God's going to show us how kind he is through his kid. He's going to show us Jesus and, be, and shower Jesus with 
praise. And all who rest in Jesus are going to receive the goodness of the kindness of God. Amen. Because I'm going to shower my son so that you get the effect of being part of my family. Amen. That's covenantal kindness. That's God is good to me, not because I earned it, paid for it. You, what could we do? He puts a parenthesis by grace. Man, you, you can't get this by being good. You can't get this by doing well. You can't get this through promises and effort and self-straining and self-sacrifice and, and, and beating your flesh. And In fact, to make sure we understand that, look at the next two verses. For by grace you've been saved through faith. That's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works lest anyone should boast. And I think we should pay attention to the greater context here because there's a lot of arguments about what is it that's the gift? Is it the faith that's a gift? Is it the grace that's the gift? I think it's the kindness of God. You can't earn the kindness of God. That's a gift. You receive it because God is good. Now take all of that information. That's a thick foundation on the kindness of God. And plug those things into those two Samuel stories. Now, I don't want to read them entirely because I know me and we'll be here too long if I try to read all of chapter 9 and chapter 10. So I want to tell you the story, all right, briefly. David had a covenant with a man named Jonathan. Jonathan was Saul's son. Saul is the king of Israel. David has been anointed to be the next king of Israel. That doesn't go over well because in the kingship of the earth, kings inherit the throne by bloodline. But God chooses David, which is not in the kingly line, to be his next king. There's a problem, though. There's a young man in the way, Jonathan. Saul has a kid. And so how are you going to incorporate, how are you going to put a king in when there's already a son in the line of kinship? And so something powerful happens that probably needs to get more attention in the Old Testament. The heart of David and Jonathan are knit together, the Bible says. So God does amazing work. He does a miracle. He causes David and Jonathan to love one another to the point that they, give, they make a blood covenant. And in that blood covenant, Jonathan says to David, listen, my dad doesn't like you, my dad hates you, my dad's trying to kill you. I'll tell you what we'll do, let's cut a blood covenant and I'm gonna be your defender. If my father's on the war path, I'll let you know. I'll always let you know where his troops are, I'll let you know what my dad's plans are because I believe God has his hand on you, he wants you to prosper, and I'm going to do what I can as long as I'm alive to make sure you stay alive. He said, on the other end of that covenant, what you'll do for me is nothing while I'm alive, you don't owe me anything, but if you'll take care of my kids after I'm gone, make sure that they always have roof over their head, food on the table, then you and I are good. And David and Jonathan clasp hands, cut covenant, pour the blood on the ground, walk between two slaughtered animals. And David and Jonathan now go about their business. Jonathan keeps his end of the deal. He warns David every time his father's on the war path. David ends up surviving Saul's wrath and becomes king of Israel. And after the dust clears and things settle, the ninth chapter of 2 Samuel, David says, is there anyone left of Saul's house that I can be kind to for Jonathan's sake? Why does he do that? Because he had a covenant. And the covenant was, I'm always going to take care of your kids. And so it comes back to David in that ninth chapter. I owe Jonathan. I don't owe Jonathan because he's good. I don't owe Jonathan because he's alive because he's not. He's not even here. He's not even here to hold me to it. Who cares if I keep it? He's dead. But that's not the way covenant works. And so David calls in a servant that knows the house of Saul. Says, is there anybody left? And he goes, yeah, there's one. Uh, Jonathan had a kid named Mephibosheth, and he's lame on his feet, which mean, probably in Hebrew literature means he can walk but not well. Uh, he has to walk with assistance. And he's living down in a place called Lodabar. Lodabar literally in the Hebrew is desert place or wasteland. And so I think the Bible's trying to show you a message. Mephibosheth don't have much. I mean, he is, he's destitute. He can't take care of himself. He probably can't even provide for his own income. And David says, bring Mephibosheth to me. And when Mephibosheth is brought into the presence of David, David says to him, I'm going to give you your father's lands back, so they're now yours, and you're going to eat bread continually at my table as if you were one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth goes, I'm a dead dog. What are you doing? How are you, why are you doing this for me? And David says to him, I'm doing it for Jonathan's sake. He makes it very clear because Mephibosheth tries to say, I don't deserve this. And David's response is, I'm doing it for Jonathan's sake. David articulates the terms of covenant so that Mephibosheth can push aside 
the self-loathing and condemnation when he eats that bread. So that when he sits at the master's table and they push that bread across to him, he can eat with, without thinking, i got to go pay David for this. Get rid of that. He, he can get, because David articulates it clearly, I'm doing this for Jonathan's sake. In other words, you could even say this, if you wanted to take it, if you wanted to take it to the natural or maybe even the darkest iteration, it could be that David goes, yeah, you're right, you don't deserve it. I can't have cripples in my presence. This, this, this makes the whole place look bad, to be honest, but I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for your dad. I loved your dad. And so I'm going to take care of you because I had a covenant with your dad to take care of you. So I, the feet are what they are. You are what you are. But you're never going to go hungry again. And the chapter ends with, and he ate continuously at the king's table, and he was lame on his feet. The Bible repeats it, which is weird in the literature. It's weird to repeat it. And the reason I think it repeats it is because it wants the reader to know that Mephibosheth didn't get healed. Not everything changed in his life. So I think sometimes we, we try to get this Christian impression that you can walk in God's inheritance, but you've got to clean up. If you don't clean up, you're really not going to get the fullness of Dad's table. If you don't fix stuff, you're not going to get everything God has for you. And the reality is, is some of us are going to keep, we're going to still be lame on our feet. There, and the Bible wants to repeat that. Go, and I think the point of it is to say, look, nothing changes. When you come into Christ, you don't then get the better things because you are a better version. You get the fullness of God always because of Jesus. You get it because of Jesus. You're not anointed because, and this was, this was and I'm not knocking my heritage, but some of my Pentecostal charismatic heritage, we used to say this kind of stuff all the time. You want to know why that guy's anointed? Because he paid the price. He paid the price for the anointing. And I would, as a kid, I'd think, God, I want to pay that price. And I did. I'd go to the Lord and say, what's the price? And the, the Lord would never tell me. So I would just try to copy the people I thought were anointed. So I'd ask them what they do. How many chapters do you read a day? How much do you pray? Do you fast very often? And I, I tried to dress like them, walk like them, read their version of the Bible, whatever. What? Because they paid the price. They got it. They paid the price. And I found you can't ever pay the price. Well, what's the price? What's the price you pay for the goodness of God? How good would you have to be to get a good God to be good to you? You go, relax. This was, this was the life transition for me is to go, Someone asked me last night what, what it was, and my response was, I started to see that God was better than I thought He was. God was bigger than I thought He was. That's true, man. That's my testimony. I, go, I think God's better than I thought He was. I think God is more loving than I thought He was. I think He's more merciful than I thought He was. And as I began to get that revelation, kind of take that in, it began to explode. I began to see God's goodness all around me and go, how is God, is as if God's getting better? How's God getting better? What did I do? He's going, you didn't do anything. You let go of the reins of trying to control God's goodness through your performance and you just went, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to eat at the king's table. And it's a beautiful chapter because Mephibosheth receives based on covenantal kindness. Well, then David gets kind of fired up. I think David's a little bit like us. He goes, that was fun. I changed Mephibosheth's life. Look at him. He's in there. can't walk, but he's in there just eating. He's getting fatter every day. God bless him. He goes, I, I want to do that again. Here's the issue. David had a covenant with Jonathan. So his kindness came out of covenant. It wasn't because of anything Mephibosheth did. It was because of a covenant. But he doesn't have a covenant with somebody else. So now his kindness, he has to dip into a different way to be kind. Because if I'm not going to be kind through the lens of covenant, what is left for me to be kind through? And that's what I present to you called the reciprocal kindness. Or I would even say it this way, societal kindness. The system of the world. And the system of the world looks a little bit like this. If you treat me well, I will treat you at least as well as you treat me. That's all I really owe you. You good to me? I'll be that good to you. I'm not required to be any better than you were to me for society to accept me. Society will shun me if you're good to me and I'm bad to you. Society will. Not, not, I'm not talking about the kingdom of God. Society will go, that's not the way this works. He was good to you. You should be good to him. Now, you don't have to be great to him, but you've got to at least be good to him. Society thinks you're really weird if you're good to him and he's been bad to you. That's, you're, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't register on the society meter of kindness. Like you're negative to him and he, he responds with 
kindness and love and society would go, that guy's a pushover. That guy's going to get run over. And that's, the, that's you, when you know. When you worry about people getting run over, you're thinking like the world. That's a telltale sign that you're thinking like the world. When you go, well, I'm worried about getting taken advantage of. That's your first red light of system of the world. I don't mean don't listen to the spirit because the spirit will... The Spirit will lead and guide you into all truth. And sometimes the truth is don't get too close to that person. And that'll be the Spirit. But you'll know that. That's, that's not your bait. Don't get close to people is not your baseline understanding of humanity. That's your red flag by the Spirit understanding of a certain individual or a certain scenario. The heart of God is kindness. That's reflected. So David goes, I want to be kind. I don't have a covenant to be kind with, but you know what? There was a guy that treated me good a long time ago named Nahash. Now, here's the interesting part. We don't know where this is. There is not a biblical story where Nahash was good to David. I scoured it trying to find it. There is not. Um, what we do have is Nahash had a, a really negative experience with Israel. Nahash is the guy that came against Israel and said, and was going to conquer them. And Israel sent some emissaries out and went, hey, what do we got to do to make peace with you? And Nahash goes, well, if you'll pluck out your right eye and cut off your right thumb, I'll, uh, I'll be, make a covenant with you. Which is a weird, that's like a military thing. You know, if you keep your shield here and your sword here, if you lose your thumb and you lose your eye, you lose your ability to fight. That was kind of the, ancient, the armor of the ancient world. So what Nahash was basically doing was going, surrender your weapons and, and I'll be your friend. And the Israelites went back and kind of thought about it and prayed about it. And then that's when they went and got Saul. And so Saul comes in and, and whips up on Nahash. And the only thing we can really find is maybe because Nahash and Saul didn't get along, maybe David and Nahash did. Any way you slice it, it's secular. Straight up. Somewhere, Nahash was good to David. So David goes, you yeah. know Nahash dies, so it's funeral time. And David goes, I'm going to go be good to his kid because his dad was good to me. So David sends a group of men to Nahash's funeral to be kind because Nahash was kind to him. And the men suspect something's up because David is sending troops in to Nahash's funeral. And you can already feel it's not going to end well. It doesn't. They physically abuse David's men, and word gets back to David that they've done that. And David says, go hole up in Jericho until your physical abuse is gone, and then I'm going to come in and take care of business. And David builds the army of Israel, and he goes in, and he wipes out the Ammonites and the Syrians, and the chapter ends with abject bloodshed. It started with, I'm going to be good to this guy because he was good to me, and it ends with bloodshed. Now, not a coincidence to me. Chapter 9, I want to be kind because of covenant. Open. End ate every day at the king's table. He was lame on his feet. Chapter 10, I'm going to be kind because someone was kind to me. End bloodshed. What's the Bible trying to tell us? There's two systems of kindness in the world. There's the kingdom kindness. There's being good and being loving and being kind and being merciful and being forgiving because it's been done to you in Christ. Not you did it to me. He did it to me. So I'm giving you what I have. Oh, you don't deserve it. You, you didn't earn it. You've been mean to me, unkind to me. I don't base my kindness to you based on that. This is because he loves me. And then there's the other kind, which is inventory everybody in your life and give them what they gave you. They've been good to you. Be just as good to them. Not anymore, or you'll be a pushover. Not any less, or you'll be selfish. Exactly what they gave to you. They've been bad to you, put them on your list. You don't own them today, hold on to that. That's a card you can play. You can use that in financial leverage. You can use that in arguments. You might want to hold on to that card for a while because revenge is a dish best served cold. And so the best thing you can do is have, a, have some stuff on some people. Know some things about him, but don't use it yet. Just hold on to it because it might come in handy right about the time you need it. That's societal reciprocal kindness. See, I'm not blaming David for being kind to Nahash's kid. I just think the Bible put a contrast there for a reason to show you there's a kindness that comes from a heart of someone who knows they're in covenant because they love their fellow man. 
And they love their fellow man simply because they know they're loved. And then there's a kindness that's obligatory. I think I need to do this. I think I should do this. Oh, I don't love them. I don't care for them at all. But there's something to be done for me down the road, and I'll give that back. And to me, that sounds very much like the world. I think what we're seeing happening in the world today, we're seeing the world push for sort of a kinder, gentler society. But some of it's birthed out of reciprocal kindness. It's not birthed out of kingdom kindness. You know, if you've got to rob one group of their rights to give another group their rights, you need to consider if we're, if we're loving people through covenant or if we're loving people through reciprocal kindness. If we're loving people through societal's eyes or through God's eyes. And that's something we need to be wrestling with. Before we just jump onto every wave that comes through, because it sounds good or because it appears to lift up one group. At the, watch where it lifts one group at the expense of the other group and see if that's the way, see if that's the liberty afforded by God or see if that's man trying to level the balances because man leveling the balances is always going to come up wanting because he's never going to level them through covenant. He's going to level them through performance. He's going to level them through worthiness. He's going to level them through history. He's going to level them through politics. He's going to level them through government. And just because it, it sounds good or it sounds positive, we as the children of God have a responsibility to be true to the covenant that we're in and the covenant of kindness that we have with our Lord Jesus. See, I do believe we owe the world, but I believe what we owe the world is love. All right? We don't owe them our loyalty. We certainly don't owe them attention. We owe them love. And that's, that's Paul's letter to the Romans. You go, honor who honor is due, uh, custom to whom custom is due, but above all things, love. What was Paul saying? There's stuff you have to do in society, but the love you have is the privilege you have to reflect who your father is. Now, let me take you to the New Testament and try to close this out. Look at Ephesians 4. We were in Ephesians 2. I want to take you to Ephesians 4. Sort of settle this, land this plane. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says this, verse 29. This will take you through the end of the chapter. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification... That's building up, by the way. That it may impart grace to the hearers. Man, that's something we ought to, that, that's something we all just kind of hold on to in our lives every day. Go, you know, if I'm going to open my mouth today, corruption's not going to come out of it. I'm going to just say whatever builds people up because that's how you impart grace to people. I'm not going to tear people down. Um, I'm going to keep a lot of my opinions to myself because I'm not obligated to share my opinions. I'm not even obligated to have one in a society that wants me to have an opinion about everything. Some things of which I just found out about five seconds ago through a Facebook meme and I'm supposed to tell you what I think. What are you talking about? I don't even know if that meme's real. I don't have an opinion on it. No, I'm going to keep my mouth shut because I'm going to impart grace to who hears, not impart gasoline to their fire because <laughs> that's easy to do. I'm just going to throw gasoline on their fire. So watch where this goes. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Time out. I actually think that Paul has just framed what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit. In the first part of that watch what you say, only minister grace. Then he goes, don't grieve the spirit. And then he goes, watch what comes out of your mouth. It sounds to me like he's building a case. The way to grieve the spirit is to speak to people opposite of the way the Holy Spirit would speak to people. Not, I mean, I was raised to, to hear in church that, you know, grieving the spirit was like chewing gum during the invitation. You get to the end of the service and the pastor's gonna, and then you, you open up candy wrapper and you go, and the pastor would go, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. The guy standing next to you might be about to receive Jesus, and you're out here making noise, going to the water fountain. That's going to keep somebody from getting saved. I don't think that. I, the Holy Spirit's way more powerful than a candy wrapper. I mean, if he's doing a work, he's going to do it whether you eat that peppermint or not. You know, I don't think that. But you want to know what you can do to grieve the Spirit? Speak to people opposite of what the Holy Spirit's saying to them. Open your mouth and give them what the Holy Spirit wouldn't give them. That grieves the Spirit. That seems to me to be what Paul's saying. But look how he caps it. This is the final verse. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Covenant. 
I am forgiven because of Jesus, so why would I be kind? Not because I should be kind to the people that have been kind to me. Not because I want to be loving to the people that have been loving to me. That's the system of the world. That's the Hanun. That's the Nahash, 2 Samuel 10, that ends in bloodshed and chaos. And, and, and the world's not a better place because you give people what they deserve. Let me say that again. The world is not a better, your world's not a better place, and the world at large is not a better place because you give people what they deserve. In fact, that's the highway to hell. All of us giving people what they've given us is the highway to hell. It's the broad way that leads to destruction. It's easy to walk on it. It's easy to walk on, I'll give you what you give me. But I give not what you give me, I give what Christ has given me. And I have to take inventory every day. Did I earn this forgiveness? No. Did I earn this favor? No. Did I earn God's mercy? No. Did I earn God's grace? No. This is why it's dangerous for you to ever think you earned anything with God. If you ever can chalk up something you think you paid for with God, then you're going to require everybody around you to pay for that from you. So if you think God's kind to you because you've been kind, then you've got grounds to go, I can only be as kind to Landon as he is to me. Because, hey, why is he any different than I am? I got it from God. He's got to get it from God, too. He's got to get it from me. But once you get past yourself and receive all of God's goodness because of Christ then all you're left with is covenantal kindness, not reciprocal kindness. I, all I can give you is what I have. I can give you the grace that's been given to me in Christ Jesus. What I hope this word does is inspire you, A, to know who you are in the covenant. Go do an investigation. Go, go check out what the Bible says about you. Maybe you need to start with make, making sure you know God is kind. That's a good foundation. Because if you still have doubts about God, you're going to have doubts about yourself. If you have doubts about yourself, you're going to have doubts about your neighbor. So settle in your spirit who God is. Settle in your spirit what's yours. Listen, you're the Mephibosheth in the story. I know we all want to be David, but you're Mephibosheth. All right? God is David. Jesus is Jonathan. You know why I read that verse in Ephesians 4? What it sounded like? What's it sound like in 2 Samuel? Who's left of the house of Saul that I may be kind to them for Jonathan's sake? What did it sound like in Ephesians 4? God hath forgiven you for Christ's sake. You know why Paul does that? Because it's in his heart and his mind as a Hebrew. It's got to be for the sake of something higher than me. It's a covenant. So God's been good to me for Jesus' sake. My kindness is paid for Jesus' sake. I love for Jesus' sake. I give you my peace for Jesus' sake. And let that begin in us today, all right? Let that be a part of the journey that we are on. Let me pray over that word to just saturate it. Let, let it just be saturated with the spirit in your heart. Father, I thank you for this moment. What a special moment with my friends today. As you've given us this glorious journey to expound on your goodness and your kindness in the word, my spirit was refreshed today just hearing how kind you are, seeing it in your word, Old Testament, New Testament. I'm, I'm moved to, the, to reinvestigate the terms of the covenant so I know what I have, so that I know what I can give out freely because freely it has been given to us, freely we give. Father, all the areas in our lives where we play the societal game, I'm going to be good to him because so-and-so was good to me. Father, we know it doesn't work, but it's still so tempting to do it. Help us to dwell on the covenant you've given us at the exclusion of responding the way the world responds. In Jesus' name, we receive it. Amen. Amen.